afternoon. I'm Sheila Wildman, uh, Associate Director of the Health Law Institute. I have the pleasure of introducing our noon hour speaker today. Uh, but first I'd like to say a couple of words on behalf of the Institute, which is co-sponsoring the Innis Christie Symposium this year. Uh, the idea for this co-sponsorship and all the planning is really down to Bruce Archibald, uh, well, Bruce and Elizabeth Sandberg and Barb Carter. Uh, it was Bruce who proposed bringing together our respective audiences, uh, that of the Health Law and Policy Seminar Series and the Innis Christie Symposium. Uh, more generally, Bruce came up with the idea of integrating the symposium's traditional uh, focus on labor and employment law with perspectives from the fields of workers' compensation and occupational health and safety. So the theme of the day uh, is work and health. Um, those of you in the health law and policy uh, seminar series crowd are encouraged to stay on for the panels that will run through the afternoon. Um, work and health, yeah? There are copies of the program online around the world. There are copies of the program around with Innes' mug on one side of the, of the paper. Um, work and health were also intertwined at the origins of the Health Law Institute. Um, Bruce mentioned this morning in his remarks that Innes Christie was dean of the law school when the institute was created in 1991. Um, Innes brought Bob Elgie in from Ontario to serve as the inaugural director of the institute, and Dr. Elgie served in that role until 1996. Um, now, Robert L. Elgie, whom I never met, uh, was one of those, you want to say, aggressive overachievers. Um, actually, I'm advised by the Institute's administrative assistant, Barb Carter, who worked for Dr. Elgie when he was director and was a small shrine to him in a filing cabinet, uh, that he was gentle as a lamb. Uh, he passed away last year at the age of 84. Dr. Elgie trained as a lawyer and then a doctor, a brain surgeon, no less. Uh, and also held various positions in government in Ontario, including service as Minister of Labour for a number of years. Uh, he was chair of Ontario's Workers' Compensation Board prior to moving to Nova Scotia and taking up the directorship of the Health Law Institute. Um, and in 1992, while serving as director of Dow's HLI, he became part-time chair of the Nova Scotia Workers' Compensation Board. Um, in it, soon after, became the Deputy Minister of Labor uh, and then Chair of Workers' Compensation here in Nova Scotia. So I think it's pretty clear that Innes had some big plans uh, when he brought Dr. Elgie to Nova Scotia back in 1991. Plans that crossed uh, the borders, not only of law and medicine, uh, but also uh, work and health. Let me just say a couple things about Innes. Innes Christie, uh, as most of you are well aware, uh, was one of those big people who saw the big picture and pointed you uh, the way to your place in it, if only you pay attention. Um, and it, it seems he did a little of that with Dr. Elgie. Uh, certainly he did that with me. Uh, like some of you in the room, I was in Innes' labor law class. Uh, he gave me a prize. <laughs> a few years on, uh, he was chair of the appointments committee when I was hired. Uh, I've never really got a proper chance to say in a public space, thanks, Innes, um, I owe you. Uh, I thought the world of Innes Christie. Um, I loved his big, gruff way of getting the job done. Um, I loved his generosity of mind and spirit uh, and the intensity with which he lived his life. Uh, I loved his enormous, world rocking laugh. Uh, I'm told he was not always an absolute gentleman on the slush court. Uh, he took a few pages, I hear, from the Don Cherry uh, playbook, uh, but that fits right in with all the rest. Uh, so I'm so glad that we're able to come together uh, on this and on other occasions to remember Innes Christie in a manner um, so fitting uh, by thinking out loud together. So with that, let me turn to today's speaker, another publicly minded intellect crossing the borders of work and health, Dr. Cameron Mustard. Dr. Mustard is president and senior scientist at the Institute for Work and Health, which I'll tell you a little bit more um, about, an independent not-for-profit research center in Toronto. He's also a professor in the Dal Atlanta School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. He completed his doctoral training in epidemiology, health policy, and behavioral sciences at the John Hopkins University School of Hygiene and Public Health. Uh, until 1999, he was a member of the Manitoba Center for Health Policy and Evaluation at the U of Manitoba. Dr. Mustard's research takes up a range of questions relating to work environments, labor market experiences, and health, 
including inquiry into the distributional equity of publicly funded healthcare programs in Canada, and the epidemiology of socioeconomic health inequalities across the life course. Uh, today he'll speak to us about disability income security programs in Canada. I'm going to turn it over to him. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sheila, very much. It is, a, it is a real pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invitation. Um, for a lot of reasons, thank you for the invitation, but not for the weather. Right? Um, okay, uh, the metaphor here in the title, A Patchwork Quilt, I'll, I'll open this idea up for you as, as I go further into my uh, remarks. Just for my benefit, how many of us in the room consider themselves lawyers, legal scholars, that, okay. And how many here are people who see themselves as in the, in the, the sphere of pr protecting and caring for the health of Nova Scotians? All right. So it's about half and half, okay. That's useful to me, useful to me. I, I'm an epidemiologist. It's kind of a weird species of public health research disciplines concerned with the distribution of uh, health in populations. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you about today is the way in which in this country we have evolved a income security programs for working aged adults who are having difficulty working because of their health. That's the disability idea. I'm going to talk to you about how over time in this country we've evolved a system which if, if I was an emerging economy asking for advice on how to do this, I wouldn't recommend the Canadian example. So I'm going to be, I hope, informative in my comments about what isn't actually optimal about the way in which disability income security programs play out for working age Canadians. Um, but I'm also going to draw, I hope, our eyes to, to the very great importance of social security programs that account for the fact that in the course of work, our working age, some proportion of us are going to be unable to work either on an episodic basis for a period of six months recovering from a mental health disorder, or perhaps more substantially, we're going to have difficulties participating in work on a, uh, a go-forward basis. And thinking about how we design income security programs that both provide adequate security, but perhaps most importantly, don't forget that each of us potentially has some contribution we can make to the world of work, and thinking about how to design the supports and services so that that potential is realized is, is a societal ambition, a goal. We've uh, eliminated mandatory retirement, so it's increasingly unclear at what age we no longer are concerned about disability income security and are now talking about retirement pensions. Um, and we're an aging workforce. So there are themes in my talk that will be, uh, I think, continuously present over the next 15 to 20 years as this country and all the other developed economies work through an aging workforce, the importance of engaging as much participation from working age adults in the labor force as we can, uh, and improving, ensuring uh, economic security for people who at various points in time have difficulty working. I'm going to be drawing on um, work of myself and my colleagues at the Institute for Work and Health, which I'll describe in a second. I'm going to draw a bit on other work by Canadians, and I'll draw on a little bit of international work as well. But the primary focus of my remarks is on this country, the state of uh, play at this point in time. Uh, so here's a brief sketch of the Institute for Work and Health. Uh, as uh, Sheila mentioned, we're an independent not-for-profit research center. The independent piece means we have our own board of directors. It's multipartite. Uh, there are labor representatives, employer representatives, and people who have experience in, it, in administering and leading uh, research institutions established in 1990, so that's 25 years of um, uh, contribution. We do work on the effectiveness of 
efforts to prevent the causes of work-related injury and illness. And, and that effort focuses both on what workplaces do or don't do, but also what regulators and uh, institutions that can provide economic incentives are doing by way of orienting workplaces to preventing the causes of work-related injury and illness. We do work on what is effective about treating and managing work-related disorders, the majority of which, uh, or at least the largest share of which, are arising from non-traumatic musculoskeletal disorders. Uh, and we've been focused, particularly in the last 10 years, on, in thinking about how to support workplace practices around returning people to work who've been out of the labor force uh, for a period of months due to a work-related disorder, how to bring people back to work successfully uh, and retain their participation both in that workforce and in the uh, Canadian labor force. And the last bullet point is, uh, it may be not transparent to many of you, but I'll open it up for you. The idea that as an applied research organization that seeks to spend our resources in such a way that we're producing knowledge that's actually, we hope, relevant to contemporary practices in workplaces in Canada, we need to figure out a way to help get that information to the many, many professional communities and workplaces in this country that might be able to use it. So that's what that idea of knowledge transfer and exchange represents. And about 20% of our resources are devoted to that engagement. Um, it's probably useful to provide a little bit more information. We run on about $7 million a year. That supports a staff of about 70 people, of whom 15 of them are PhD-trained scientific staff. That works out to about a dollar a worker a year in Ontario. It's not a lot of money, but on the other hand, there's no other, with the exception of Quebec, there's no other research molecule in Canada that's funded as generously as we are to attend to or support the efforts in a provincial economy to reduce the burden of work-related injury and illness. Um, and our funding comes from the Provincial Workers' Compensation Authority. So you can think of it as a contribution from employers, workers' comp insurance <laughs> premiums towards generating knowledge that is non-proprietary, hopefully beneficial, and available to all workplaces in Ontario. And I'm just going to, Sheila, just acknowledge one thread here that ties the Health Law Institute and the Institute for Work and Health together, and that's Bob Elgy. So this is a lovely story. So uh, when Bob Elgy was the chair of the Ontario Workers' Compensation Board, one of the challenges that he and his senior leadership were facing is the decisions, sorry, decisions about what therapies to pay for in the treatment of work-related musculoskeletal disorders. And LG, being a physician, recognized that maybe what we needed here was some evidence about what works and what doesn't work. So LG advocated for, and he wasn't the only voice, the establishment of an independent research organization that could provide advice to the Workers' Compensation Authority on the purchase of effective health services. And that was the genesis of the Institute for Work and Health. And it was shortly after that that Bob Elgy came here to do something else equally innovative, which was to set up the Health Law Institute, I think the first in the country, you know? And maybe at the time people were scratching their heads going, what do we need that for? Uh, well, we know now why we need that. There are so many dimensions of the way life unfolds for us where our health and the legal framework in which uh, we respond to that is absolutely fundamentally important. And I think, perhaps, that the discussion today about disability income security will take us to that place, although I'm not going to be able to speak to those of you in the room who are um, legal scholars. I'm not going to be able to speak to you particularly insightfully about what are the frameworks of um, uh, legal what are the legal frameworks that have set out the context in which we're in today? So the outline for my talk today, I'm going to give you a brief summary of where we are in this country in terms of the prevalence of disability among working age adults. I'm, I'm going to spend only maybe about five or ten minutes talking to the second point, which is it's an idea that I think we can give some greater attention to, which is the ways in which within workplaces we can actually prevent 
disability. And I'll try to illustrate the ways in which we're making, I think, important progress in this country. Uh, the third theme will be to illustrate for you how the disability income security programs in this country are best, I think, described as a patchwork quilt. And that metaphor contains a lot of ideas in it. The idea that the parts of the quilt are composed from fundamentally different pieces of fabric in terms of who made them and what they're intended to do. Um, but also the idea that it's been stitched together to try to build, I shouldn't even use that word, it's been stitched together in a way that there are gaps and um, disparities in the way the income security programs play out for Canadians. I'm going to offer a few international comparisons and then provide a summary of um, some observations. Good so far? Okay. So at a, at some remarks at a very high level, uh, the health benefits of employment. You know, I, we can sometimes perhaps be um, come to think of work experiences as in some, over the, say the period of, of a working career, uh, contributing to the deterioration of our health. And for some of us that's true, that the occupational experiences and the occupational demands that we are engaged in for 20 or 30 years can, can take a toll. But the, the general, I think, finding across many different societies in many different times is in addition to being the mechanism by which we distribute economic resources in a society, that's work, um, it has other benefits. It contributes to somebody's identity in terms of who they are. Lots of psychological needs are fulfilled. And there are ways in which work can contribute to better physical and mental health. And if you flip it around the other way and compare the opportunity to be engaged in employment to, be, to the opportunity not to, in other words, unemployment, the, the evidence from the field of epidemiology around the adverse health effects of unemployment are very clear. Early, earlier mortality, poorer mental health, and higher use of health services among those of us who uh, are exposed to either temporary or chronic episodes of unemployment. So the health benefits of employment are substantial. But so are the negative effects of employment on health. Um, these negative effects are, are, I think, what's the word? Um, as we pass through each of the last 50 decades, these negative effects have been declining. So I, I could say work is safer, work is healthier over the last 50 years without any hesitation, but work can continue to be improved in terms of the ways in which it causes preventable morbidity uh, among the Canadian workforce. If, if you were to sort of cost out what, what the economic burden of work-related injury and illness in Ontario represents, it's about 3% of GDP. It's not a number you can just sweep under the carpet. It's a lot of money. And th that's an estimate of both the direct costs and indirect costs. To just paint a portrait of what the personal burden is in terms of lives changed, in my province, two traumatic fatalities or about 100 a year, um, now three times that annually number of deaths due to occupational disease where it was a work exposure that was the uh, underlying cause of the development of the disease, in this case primarily cancers. Uh, and more than 1,500 disabling injuries a week in my labor market of 6 million people. Okay. And then if you were to look uh, in the province in terms of lost work days, both due to work-related and non-work-related injury or illness in the course of a year, you're looking at about 135,000 person years of work that are missing because of uh, work-related, non-work-related illness or disability. So the health effects are not insignificant of employment. To, to then just draw our eyes a bit to the idea of, of disability. I'm going to spend a moment just talking about exactly what do we mean. 
and I'm going to use the, I'm going to reference the way in which our National Statistics Agency approaches this. So these data are from Statistics Canada. So the idea of disability is that a health condition or a health impairment has the consequence of limiting our ability to do certain things, tasks or activities, that are valued to us, valuable to us, that we value. So the idea is that a health impairment results in a limitation around activities that we would wish to engage in in order to participate in activities that we value. One of those activities being work, right? That's one. But so are leisure activities. So the Statistics Canada measure of disability in Canada goes something like this. A respondent to a survey is asked the question, do you have a physical or mental condition that's lasted at least six months that limits your ability to, and I, just, I meant to bring it with me. Did I do it? I did. Okay, it goes like this. Does a long-term physical condition or mental condition or health problem reduce the amount or kind of activity you can do? Sometimes, often, never. And these estimates here are the people answering sometimes or often. Okay. There are further questions asked about in what way, in, in what domains of your life does this limitation occur? Does it occur at school, at work, in other activities? It's a really important thing to try to measure, but it's a really tricky thing to measure with a degree of precision, confidence, reliability. And I think to the credit of Statistics Canada, they've always been uncomfortable that they're not entirely sure what this is, but that they know that it's important. So with that as a, as a background, and I would say, let me put it this way, most of the developed economies now estimate the proportion of, say, working age adults who have a disability by using a similar framework. Is there something about your health that's limiting what you do and, it's, and what you do is something that's important to you? Okay. So this is all-cause disability, whether this is vision impairment, musculoskeletal impairment, cognitive impairment, whether it's congenital or acquired, whether it's been around only for the last six months or from the day you were born. It's the composite of all of those causes produces estimates like this, such that by the time we get to 45 to 54 year olds in 2006, 15% of us are saying, yep, there's something about my health that's getting in the way of stuff I like to do. Okay? So it rises with age. Um, and it's been going up a little bit in the population. So you can see the difference in the bars between 2001 and 2006. Some of this increase is due to the way in which the population is aging, but you can see this is age stratified. So other things are going on. We, we are probably expanding in our minds as we respond to these surveys individually what we think is an, is an, an appropriate answer. Uh, and there's probably a reduction in so social stigma concerning the reporting of disability that's contributing to this gentle rise. Uh, as far as I think we would, it would be our view, let me put it this way, it would be our view that the underlying health impairments that result in disability are not rising particularly quickly in the Canadian population. In fact, for many conditions, we're seeing improvements over time such that the health impairment piece of this is not what's driving this. And in, here's, here's one of the ways in which, dis, in which health impairments disable people, and that's in terms of their participation in the labor force. So two time periods, five years apart, the labor force participation of people without disability and the participation of people with some degree of disability. Some of it's severe, some of it's mild. And we're reporting the proportion of people in those categories who are participating in employment. And one of the important observations here from 2001 to 2006 is the proportion of people who reported that they had some degree of disability who were in employment was going up. 
And we can see this in the developed economies. I don't think this is some artifact of measurement. I think this is, for example, in this country, an expression of the impact of, in Ontario, the reform to the Human Rights Code in 1987, Bob Elgee. Bob Elgee did that as the Minister of Labor. I may have the year wrong. No, it was before that, 1978. Bob Elgee, Minister of Labor, reformed the Human Rights Code. This is before the Federal Charter. To add to the prescribed, the, to, to add that people with disabilities cannot be discriminated against. The disability discrimination piece. So we've been seeing over time in this country an, a, an expanding expectation that disability is not a barrier to employment. Should not be a barrier to employment. Okay, but the gap in labor force participation remains very substantial, about 22% uh, difference. Okay, now I'm going to change the theme a little bit to, to, the, uh, to the idea of how are we doing in this country, and these snapshots are mostly from Ontario, in terms of our efforts to accommodate people who have health impairments in employment. And I think these examples, if I'm not mistaken, these examples are not exclusively drawn from the workers' compensation regime, and I'll explain that in a bit more detail, but they mostly are. So here's an example of positive progress. In 1994, which is now 20 years ago, we had the opportunity to interview 1,500 workers who had been disabled by a musculoskeletal disorder, and the interview took place at about the 30th day of disability. The one of the questions that was asked of them was, has your employer spoken to you about how he or she, the employer, could modify work in order to accommodate you coming back to work before you fully recovered? So this is the idea that I've got mobility, but I've got a lot of pain. I'm, I'm not sure I can go back to work. And the employer, if the employer can accommodate that by modifying work, you could come back to work. That's the idea here. 1994, 25% of workers said, yeah, yeah, my employer called. It's not a very good number. Meaning 75% of workers were essentially out of touch with their employer. Uh, 2005, only 10 years later, 600 workers, it's the same model, 30 days into the disability episode, asked the question, has your employer been in touch with you? 60% said yes. It's actually a pretty important change in a short period of time. Why did it change? It's changed because legal counsel, speaking with employers, has been saying, you have a duty to accommodate. It's because workers' compensation schemes have a set of financial incentives that make it a positive action for employers to do this, bring people back to work before they're fully recovered. Okay? So this is, this is a, a portrait of a change in the right direction. This is another example of a change in the right direction. This is just a snapshot from a, uh, uh, a very high quality service in Ontario that is advisory to both workplaces and labor unions about labor law called Lancaster House. It's quite good. They do workshops and conferences and <laughs> webinars and stuff. And, and here's just an example of an hour and a half webinar on what are the employer's obligations around the duty to accommodate an employee who has a health impairment. Excellent. This is not easy to do. You want to build skills in, a, in most workplaces, all workplaces. You want to build skills to be able to respond to this legal duty in human rights and the charter to accommodate people with disabilities so that you're not discriminating, okay? And here's, this will just take me a moment to explain this to you, but it's a portrait of diversity. It's not a portrait of progress. This is a snapshot at two points in time, 40 long-term care facilities in the province of Ontario. So long-term care are nursing homes, caring for the primarily elderly, often, cognitively, very seriously cognitively impaired members of the community. The work in these facilities, which is what we're showing you here, is uh, very high in terms of physical demands. Caregiving in these settings is very high physical demands, and it's low wage work, okay? 
and it's gendered. Okay? It's mostly women. Okay. But it's very important work. So the left hand side is showing a portrait of the dot. Each dot is a long term care facility. And it's the facility's disability days at two points in time 2005 on the bottom axis, 2006 on the vertical axis. And the point of this is that a facility's <coughs> The, the intensity, the, the number of disability days per 100 staff is not a random event. It's a trait, almost, of the facility. To try to put this in proportion for you, 1,000 disability days for every 100 staff, let's imagine that each person works 200 days a year. Yeah, that's about right, sort of. 1,000 disability days means that in that facility, there are five person years of absence for every 100 staff. Five full person years of absence. That's a lot of disability, OK? And what the left-hand side is saying is that there are a small number of facilities in which the incidence of disability is very, very low. These are disability days counted as the, the person's not able to be at work because of their health, and, and the health issue is primarily work-related. In other words, it was caused by work. That's how we were counting it in this context. There are a small number of facilities with very good outcomes, but the majority of them have some work to do. Okay, the right-hand side is a different portrait. Of the disability days that a facility was, the staff were experiencing in a facility, what proportion of them were managed, to use an awkward word, by the employer providing modified work? This is, we believe, largely a good thing. So modified work is where the employer says, OK, Anne, you can't do your regular work because of that sprained knee. But we have something equally useful for you to do that doesn't require that you use your knee. And if you could do that for two weeks for us, we'll bring you back to work. So uh, that idea here is represented by the, the long-term care facilities in the top right corner. And again, this is the same, this is 40 facilities, two points in time, separated by a year. How are they doing? And again, it's a trait of the facility that about a third of the facilities are figuring out ways to bring people back to work by adjusting the work that they're asking people to do. And about a third of the facilities in the bottom left-hand corner are not doing that. Okay? All right. So some themes over the last um, 10 or 15 years, and I think we can say this is pretty much the case across this country. It's not just Ontario. That, that, the, that the influence of uh, 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 employment law council to employers and the behavior of disability income <coughs> insurers has had the following influences, I think. That in medium and large employers, it's increasingly rare that you will not find something called an accommodation policy or a disability management policy. It's increasingly rare. Generally, these policies are supported by organized labor. In fact, I think it is fair for the steel workers of this, the United Steel Workers, the Canadian, what are they called? You know, the Canadian arm of the United Steel Workers to say that, that they've actually led this country in terms of embedding in collective agreements the principles of disability management. Okay. So this is not adversarial. Employers can do this. They can do it cooperatively or with the participation of organized labor. And it's very much good thing. a good thing. What it does is it creates a platform of discipline in the workplace about fairness of process. Everybody should be treated the same. And the process is clear. Um, it has been the case that increasingly the insurers in long-term disability plans, which I'll describe a bit in a moment, have introduced active case management. What that means is that the insurer just doesn't pay the benefits to the disabled worker. The insurer is actually making phone calls. That's case management. The insurer is calling up the health care provider and saying, how come you're not more optimistic that you know, Anne could maybe get back to work? 
It's that kind of thing. Not coercive, just looking for ways in which there may be opportunities to advance progress towards getting people back to work. We see the same thing in workers' compensation boards. Historically in this country, workers' compensation boards saw their job as adjudicating entitlement and paying benefits. But increasingly across the country, while those two functions continue, they're also engaging with the question of what's not going right here in terms of getting somebody back to work. Is it an obstinate workplace? It is, a, is it a, uh, a health care provider who's actually a barrier to a worker returning to work? Where is the obstacle? And the final point that we're seeing some uh, significant information technology investments which are really necessary to support high quality uh, case management services. So the summary to this point about the prevention of work disability and the idea here is if the employer is vigilant and attentive and is able to and is committed to accommodating people with health impairments we can prevent the kind of disability at work that we really, really want to prevent, which is somebody gets knocked out of the labor force for the rest of their life. That's what we want to prevent. So that's the idea here of work disability prevention. And I think we're making uh, important and sometimes quite impressive progress at the level of what our workplace is doing. So I'm now going to turn to the theme of the metaphor of the patchwork quilt. And I just want you to work with me on this scenario and tell me what you think the outcomes are. The idea about this scenario is it depends what kind of work you, are, work you do, what your occupation is. It depends, those things influence which disability income security program you end up having entitlement or access to. So the scenario, unfortunately, is the same. A motor vehicle collision, spinal cord injury, permanent disability. Okay? These are all men. The first man, self-employed construction worker, driving to his work site. Second is a male insurance manager with 10 years of employment tenure. And the third is a male commercial truck driver. So the self-employed construction worker, would he or she be eligible for entitlement to workers' compensation benefits in the province of Nova Scotia? Okay. We're not sure? Okay. In Ontario, not. If you're self-employed, whether you're a self-employed videographer, whether you're a self-employed filmmaker, self-employed musician, self-employed uh, construction worker, you're not eligible to insure. The male commercial truck driver is in an employment relationship. Would he be covered? Workers' compensation? The this is just driving to work. No, sorry. The first one, the first case <coughs> was driving to work. The third case, he's driving, during work. he's driving in the course of employment. And he has an employment relationship. Well, what's the second one? So the third one is covered by workers' compensation. The second one, it's a little unclear whether this individual was driving in the course of employment, but it kind of doesn't matter because this individual is probably covered by a workplace long-term disability plan. Okay? So here's the story. The first person probably did not take out an individual LTD plan. Probably didn't because they're fairly expensive. He is not covered by workers' comp because of his self-employment. We'll explore then, well, what sources of disability income security might he have, and we'll explore that. It might be the Canada Pension Plan disability benefit if he has paid in and if he has paid in his contributory requirements. Absent, absent that, let me pause and say he would probably qualify for CPP disability because of the nature of the severity of the disability. But absent that entitlement, the building up of the contributions, this individual would be a, likely a social assistance beneficiary. Okay? Second person, uh, probably the highest paid of these three, is in a workplace setting where there's an employment provided LTD plan. 
The third person would draw benefits from the provincial workers' compensation scheme because the injury arose in the course of employment. Okay. So let me then just now look at the, uh, this is the fiscal portrait of disability benefit expenditures in Canada. It's a lot of money. It's $25 billion. And I, I don't want to be unkind, but I'm going to be critical. Statistics Canada can't count this. This is twice the amount of money that is paid, this is an amount of money twice that that the employment insurance pays out in this country. Now we, I'm not, the employment insurance is a very important social security program. Covers people for the economic uh, losses arising from loss of employment. We hope that loss of employment is temporary and EI fills in that gap. But this is $25 billion it's twice the $12 billion we pay it annually in EI. And Statistics Canada can't count this up. This work was done by uh, somebody who we have a great deal of respect for, by the name of John Stapleton, who did, spent his career in the Ontario Public Service working in uh, the social assistance policy area. Uh, and John's taken it upon himself to build this information up from provincial, national <coughs> sources. The, the point here, though, is to give you a sense of how this is, a, this is the beginning of the portrait of the, of the uh, patchwork quilt. We have in the top left-hand corner about $5 billion a year paid out in employment-based long-term disability plans. We have at least twice that much paid out in provincial social assistance programs for people who are qualifying for a disability benefit. We have about $5 billion in workers' compensation, the oldest social security program in this country, coming up on its 100th anniversary. It may have already been 100 in Nova Scotia. Has yes, it? Not quite. Not quite. Thank you. Uh, it's such... This spring. This spring. All right, thank you. D just note that down. The oldest social security program in this country, founded in 19... Depends on which province, 1915, 16, 17. It's been with us continuously since then. It's funded by, the insurance scheme is funded by contributions, premiums paid by employers. There's a wonderful historic compromise about how this all came together. And it's still with us. We still need it. It's $5 billion a year paid to cover the cost of medical care and the wage replacement benefits for temporary and permanent disability arising from work-related causes, $5 billion a year. Okay, there's some tax measures that are relatively small in 2008, 2009. The um, Veterans Affairs Federal Government Program has a responsibility for uh, disability benefits of about $2 billion for people who've served in the Canadian Armed Forces and about 1994, Five, I think, the Employment Insurance Scheme introduced a sickness benefit, which is time-limited benefit of, I think, a maximum of 15 weeks that people can qualify for if their health is impairing their ability to, to seek, to look for and find employment. Just by the way, the tax measures, I think, is now up to about $2 billion. This snapshot is about five years old because, and I won't go into the detail of what it is, but... Um, the Canadians are drawing upon that tax credit uh, instrument fairly actively. And uh, among the things that we lost when Jim Flaherty died was a champion in the federal, current federal government for addressing the needs of Canadians with disabilities. And many of the tax measures that we see here are not exclusively, but are largely out of uh, Flaherty's leadership in the current conservative federal government. Okay, so this is just a snapshot of a short document that is the summary work that underlies that pie graph that John Stapleton put together that Stats Canada can't count for reasons that's another story, but they should count it because it's $25 billion and it represents an important intersection between health and uh, economic security of Canadians. Okay, so I'm now going to do a sketch of four of the seven disability income security schemes to try to communicate a bit of a flavor about 
how easy it is for the, this, this patchwork quilt to create gaps where either eligibility can't be established by somebody or the benefit amount would probably not meet our standards of sufficiency. Okay. So the opening statement is, unlike many OECD countries, disability income insurance programs in Canada are poorly integrated. There are many countries that just use one. They tend to be Northern European, stereotypically, you know, Scandinavian, but they're not exclusively Scandinavian. We've managed to evolve a system that is reliant on a diversity of programs. We have the National Pension Plan, which has a disability benefit program in it. The Canada Pension Plan is financed by contribu contributions from employers and employees. Okay, it's contributory jointly. We have the provincial workers' compensation agencies. They're publicly administered. They're monopoly insurers. It's mandated that employers, if they're in scope, have to, have to participate. And it's funded by premiums paid by employers. So the employee isn't contributing here. We have provincial social assistance programs. They're funded by general tax sources. And they have a disability uh, benefit program. And the last example, or the last model I'm going to describe are employment-based long-term disability plans. And these employment-based LTD plans, they're voluntary. There's no mandate that employers must provide them. The provider is the private insurance industry in this country, which is, I won't go there for a moment. And uh, although, although who's actually paying the premiums in these plans is variable, it depends on what the arrangements are, it's not unusual to find LTD plans that are fully funded by employee contributions where the employer doesn't contribute. Okay. Is that for tax reasons? Is that for tax reasons? I don't know. That it's a taxable benefit if the employer is paying. Yeah, you may be right. Yeah, that, that's a false. Uh, it, it doesn't lead you anywhere because what employers do is say the employees will pay 100% because they will benefit from the tax point of view when they go on with the utility. You'll balance that by paying uh, 100% of something else. Okay. Yeah, okay. 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 That's why it, okay. that looks like that. Okay. So there's a little sketch of who's paying, into what, for what purposes. But here's a little bit more detail. The Canada, plan, the Canada Pension Plan, the disability benefit. It's a national program, so this is federal. So if you're a CPP contributor, you're eligible to build up entitlement towards the disability benefit. The number of beneficiaries, about 300,000. The benefit expenditures in a year is about $4 billion. The plan elements, it's contributory. In other words, you have to contribute as an employee and employer in order for the employee to have the opportunity to apply. The benefits are not generous. About 30 to 40 percent of, I'm just using the phrase, the average industrial wage. They're not generous benefits. The CPP disability plan has a very stringent definition of disability. Severe and prolonged disability such that a person is incapable of any gainful employment. This is a very stringent definition. As a consequence, CPP has no history of providing service supports for labor market reentry. If you're a CPP D beneficiary, you will never, I shouldn't say it, historically, up until recently, you would not have gotten any advice from CPP D about what your potential might be to return to the labor force in some role. Uh, a technical detail that CPP is treated as a first payer. And, and not surprisingly, but related to the stringency of the definition, about 30% of that, only about, how does this go? About 30% of applications are approved. So there's an extensive appeal activity. It takes a long time to get a CPPD application approved. It's an administratively frictional process. Okay? Uh, workers' compensation. They, these are provincial programs. So to the credit of the Federation, every province has one. They are remarkably similar despite that 
sort of stewardship by 10 and now 10 provincial legislatures, they're remarkably similar. Uh, the beneficiaries annually in terms of number of new, I'm getting confused here between new cases and stock. I think that's the, the, the numbers of people in any year receiving a long-term disability benefit. In other words, expected to be paid over multiple years. It's not an incidence. It's not 130,000 new a year. It's 130,000 in a year. Expenditure is about 5.4 billion. Um, the entitlement here arises from the employment relationship. So people who are not in, people who are self-employed in Ontario are not eligible to contribute here. But the large majority of, I shouldn't say that. Look up at the top. The, the coverage of these programs ranges from about 96% of workers in Newfoundland to 70% of workers in Ontario. So there's some uncovered employment relationships in Ontario that are covered in Newfoundland. This, this is just to describe some provincial differences. Um, the benefits are relatively generous. In fact, they are intended to be. They are intended to replace the wages of approximately 85% of post-tax pre-injury earnings. It's a moderate definition of disability, permanent impairment affecting work capacity, and interestingly, the workers' compensation schemes across this country have had very strong service supports around helping people get back to work. Contrast that with CPPD, which uh, has the expectation that you're never going to work again, so we won't provide you any service supports. The workers' comp schemes are very active in making investments to help people get back to work. Social assistance, the disability benefit, these are provincial programs. Everybody who's a citizen is eligible. Beneficiaries, it's a hard number to come at. It's probably about 500,000 people at any point in time. Expenditures, about $8 billion. It's not, uh, it's not contributory in the sense that you don't pay in contributions to earn eligibility, but the entitlement is means tested. You have to be, you have to show that you have no income and that your uh, wealth, your stock of wealth is very low. Uh, the benefits are very low. It's basically poverty. If not, it's below poverty. It's a fairly stringent definition of disability. And again, the social assistance plans in this country really don't have an expectation of labor market reentry. Okay. And the last of the four that I want to illustrate are the employment-based LTD plans. Um, they begin to show up in Canada, I think, in the 1980s. I could be wrong. That's my sense. They're voluntary. So this is the private insurance industry making available to employers and their workforce uh, pl uh, insurance plans to cover wage loss in the event of um, work, in work disability, typically for causes that wouldn't be covered by workers' compensation. So a woman with breast cancer in her 50s or somebody who is knocked out of work due to a chronic uh, depressive condition would be the kinds of conditions where we're not attributing the, con the health condition to work causes, but the consequence is the person can't work. Maybe 200,000 beneficiaries, but this is hard to tell because this is the private insurance industry at work, and they will, they will report on their benefit expenditures, but they don't really talk much about how many Canadians are receiving benefits. They do talk about how many Canadians are insured, but they don't talk about how many people are receiving benefits. Contributory, typically employee-funded. Benefits are moderately generous, 65% of pre-disability earnings, a moderate definition of disability. Very high expectation of labor market reentry, and typically these plans drop benefits after 24 months. From, the, um, from compensating people for the, the earnings they would have had in their previous occupation, to compensating them for earnings they would have in any occupation. So the benefit amount at 24 months just drops right down. Okay. So there's a sketch of how we've built things in this country. It is a bit of a patchwork quilt. And you think back to the three scenarios that I opened this section of the talk with, and you can appreciate that depending on what occupation you're in 
and what the circumstance of the moment was, you may end up in any one of these circumstances. And I do just want to point out that the coverage of the Canadian workforce by private LTD plans has basically stalled at about 50%. It's been 50% for 15 years. It hasn't gone up. And why hasn't it gone up? It hasn't gone up because the part of the market that is feasible for the private insurance industry to insure is insured. The part of the market that's hard to do, smaller employers, mm, less uh, stable workforces, uh, the insurance industry is not really reaching out to cover them. So there's about 50% of the labor force, it's probably 45%, that is not, does not have access to this kind of insurance. Just thinking about where I am in my remarks. How's it going so far? Is it good? The right amount of information, more than you ever wanted. Okay, uh, um, there's not actually that much data in this talk for an epidemiologist. Uh, this is a portrait, I think what I do is just draw your eye to the far right hand column where we've got men and women in three age groups. And th these are rates per thousand. So the, the idea here is that by the time we get here, 55 to 64 years of age, my age, one out of 10 women and one out of 10 men is receiving a disability income security benefit in this country. One out of 10. So, and where are they receiving it from is what the columns are. I don't think that's particularly germane today, but one out of 10 at the highest age groups, that's the impact of probably two things. It's the way in which as we grow older, our health can start to be more consequential for our labor force participation. But it's also telling us something about the way in which at the end of our working career, people may have to make certain choices about how they're gonna leave work before they're eligible for retirement. It may be telling us something about that too. And the, the, the overall number for the Canadian labor force in 2001, which is now a long time ago, um, is about 5% of women and 5% of men. So no gender differences in the prevalence, I guess I would say, of disability income security beneficiaries but a strong age gradient, as you probably would expect. So you may be asking yourself the question, I know we did, we got hit by, and we're still working through, the impact of the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009. What happened as people in the labor market got knocked out? How did the disability income security programs, how did they fare as people in the Canadian labor market either fell out of employment or were seeking employment in, uh, in the post-recession period when the unemployment rate's up, the number of, of job opportunities is down. What happens? Well, one of the scenarios that labor economists will talk about, and I'm not one of those people, so this is what they talk about, is that people will seek out alternate sources of income if they can't succeed in the labor market. So. The, the speculation that during periods of economic challenge in a developed economy, you will see an increase in people applying for social security benefits, certainly, but perhaps disability benefits, okay? And certainly the US social security, what's that benefit called? This social security, social security disability benefit has seen very large increases since the recession. In Ontario, we basically saw only one program spike. So there's six programs here, one, two, three, four, five. There's six programs here that they're generally all going up at about what sort of inflation plus um, labor market aging would, would expect that us to see over about a five year period. The one that blew out, this one here, is the social assistance for the disabled program provincially administered, essentially welfare program, lowest benefits, but universal entitlement, okay? 
that it would appear that all of the other programs kind of however they did it sort of held the line in terms of maintaining the entitlement criteria that they had before the recession blew through and didn't substantially increase the number of beneficiaries. Is that story kind of clear? Maybe. Maybe. All right. Say again? How many governments were up for re-election? How many governments were up for re-election? Okay. So as we move towards, I think I'll skip over this. Yeah. Let me just, just do a few things about uh, some international comparisons. The, um, I think I'll go here first. Okay. So over the last uh, more than, it's about 10 years. Over the last 10 years, there's been a very talented team in the uh, OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which has been looking in at a fairly fine degree of detail ab at the disability policies in about 15 member countries in the OECD. And it's been, it's been a fascinating set of studies about the diversity of ways in which, these are mostly Northern European countries, have built policies which achieve, try to achieve two things. You want to provide economic security to people during their working age if they can't work because their health is getting in the way. So the economic security piece. But you also want to have policies that are actively supporting people participating in work and returning to work. And it's, it, they're kind of like, they're not contradictory, but they're by no means mutually supportive policy goals. And the OECD work has identified sort of typologies of countries, if you will. So the UK, for example, is a country that has adequate benefits, but almost no encouragement over the last 20 years to help people get back to work. Uh, Scandinavian countries are a good balance of adequate benefits and pretty aggressive efforts to help people go back to work. And Canada, there's a country study of Canada in this series, which was one of the last countries they did. And I, we met with the study team, and after they'd sunk their teeth into Canada for about two months, they, they came by our offices and they said, is this really what we think we're seeing here? This, all of this bits and pieces and, and federal and provincial? And, and then I said, yep, that's what it is. So the OECD recommendations for Canada, the study team recommendations for Canada, are very thoughtful around the necessity of figuring out a way in this federation to improve the coordination of services between these programs. This is largely for the benefit of the beneficiaries in the programs. Anyhow, just let's see. Sheila says I've got a few minutes left. Okay, let me just do one other little observation here. This, <coughs> there's a portrait of a small number of countries. We would think of them as our economic competitors, we probably see them as our s social peers in terms of what these countries have accomplished for their citizens. The first column is, of all the people in these countries who are disabled, what proportion are employed? So Canada is at the lower end of a scale that doesn't go very high, right? So. People in Canada who are disabled, 40% are in employment according to the date of this work. And that's at the low end of what we observe in other countries. Move over to the, the second last column on the right. Of those people who are unemployed or not active in the labor force because of disability, all right? How many don't receive any benefits at all? So that's 15%, which is a, a concerning number. It's not the worst on the chart, but it's by no means the best on the chart. So, so the 15% are persons with disability who are neither in employment nor receiving benefits. When they look at being employed, that's part-time employment as well? Sorry, would it be part-time? Yeah, 
Yeah. 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 Okay, so I think I'm going to wrap up because you might have some questions of me that you'd like to kick around. Um, okay, I'll do it here. Okay, so here's a summary of the patchwork quilt. Um, the historic scheme in this country for protecting workers in the event of disability at work, limited to those causes that are attributed to exposures at work, ensures approximately 25% of the disability that we see in this country these days. Okay, that's not bad, but it's just to put it in, put it in context that the workers' compensation schemes, 100 years old, <coughs> Their coverage is only 25% of the disability that we see in working age adults. Disability benefit coverage is very uneven. From universal to, in the case of LTD plans, only 50% of the population. There's large differences in benefit generosity. Um, and with one exception, which was the example of the uh, expansion of social assistance beneficiaries in Ontario for the disability benefit, that we haven't really seen any significant trends in the inc incidence of disability beneficiaries. And I think the final slide, the final point here is, is consequential. And I'm thinking back over the last 10 years, we really haven't seen any significant reforms of public programs. And especially the concern that the public programs are this is a strong word, discouraging labor force participation, but, but perhaps put it more positively, not doing enough to encourage labor force participation. And, and, I, and I would acknowledge that those people who are policy making or have been policy making over the last 10 years have had to fight some pretty damn significant fires arising from the global financial crisis. Uh, so perhaps understandable that at this moment in time, we haven't seen any particular attention to how can we enable the participation of people with disability in the labor force? Sheila, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I just call it up. I don't know the answer. I think it's a bit of both. Um, my, my sense in general is that the, uh, that the access to disability income security benefits has not, has not become more constrained over the time period. So I think it's probably more the former that employers are seeing slowly but surely the ways in which people with health impairments can be productive workers and they're hiring them. Okay, good question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, from my experience, it seems that some of these programs seem to think that making accessibility to the benefit more difficult and more stringent is a way to encourage to force people back to work. And my sense is, and I don't know, I guess the question is, have there been any studies on the adverse effects of that kind of stress? on employees who are disabled and can't get benefits. And they may, for example, have to go to social assistance with all that in hands instead of taking long-term disability or WCB. Right. That's a great question. So one of the ways in which this uh, patchwork quilt fails us uh, as a society is we don't have any good information. There's no accountability for documenting the journey, if you will. So the journey is I'm a, I'm a full-time tradesperson. I've worked for 10 years. I had a pretty serious upper extremity injury. I received workers' compensation benefits for a period of time. And then that program made the decision that I'm okay to go back to work, right? An adjudicated decision that I'm okay to go back to work, but I can't. What happens to that person on their journey? Their next stop is probably social assistance. So that, that, that 
the way in which people move through programs is not documented in this country. Nobody's accountable for it. No, no authority is accountable for it. Right? You'd, you'd hope in a province that, that somebody would say to those two authorities, you need, to, you need to tell us how that's happening. But nobody has. So it's a great question. Yes, sir. Um, these these uh, disability programs or payments or income replacement are they are they taxable? Or not? Like or when you're calculating the cost to groups, are you uh, you know, right. is paying it out but then they're taxing right. back? So they're not taxable. They're not taxable. That I'm just pausing on the private LTD plans, but I don't think they're taxable. One of the reasons Statistics Canada can't count disability benefits is because they're not record, they're, we're not required to record them when we file our income tax returns because they're not taxable, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And it's an it's a astonishing blind spot as a consequence that we don't know, we just don't know. But did you have a question? Hi, Diane. Yes. Um, when you're talking about accommodation, the Supreme Court is only on individual accommodation. And I don't know how we force an individual versus systemic accommodation. And what I mean by systemic accommodation is designing things in a way that avoids problems coming up, but you don't do it in a way that's focused on the individual. Do you accomplish the same things? Um, I'm visually impaired. Figured out that using this model to eight power modem and patient building and other stuff. Sorry, individual accommodation enables me to use this eight power bank card to, to read the screens. Um, I'm now retired, but the last few years of my employment, I got an iPad and it. Made things in a lot of it's not perfect, it's kind of like perks from my perspective as I'm individually here. But it dealt with a whole lot of issues quite well and still does now that I've been with that. But an example of how somebody up there doesn't think about systemic accommodation, iBooks and Como are quite good in terms of being able to read things in a font that's comfortable for me. Even though the largest font by the chain is really small. And it's, so it's obviously not that it can't be done. Right. That's a great good. example. That's a great example. But we can use one more example, and I hope you will consider this critical at that one time. Um, your slides, the earlier ones that have the bars the two years, I am having a hard time. <laughs> I could only see the dark. No, oh, I apologize. Yeah. All right. yeah, I just had to stare at it for several minutes to go, oh, there's another bar. There's a very the pale office. one there. All right. Point <laughs> taken. <Good>. Thank you. <laughs> so, time for one more? Yeah, one more. Some people have to leave for class. But we have to leave for class. Okay. Yeah, I'm very interested. Um, I looked at some studies in Europe, and I'm very interested in, in uh, disability and older workers. And of course, they have some unique problems and concerns. And what happened to some considerable extent in some of the European countries as as they raise the retirement age to get on the side, because retirement ages generally are much lower there than here, <laughs> the disability uh, branch just filled up. And that's what people, this is a search for other sources of income. And so it seems to me, if, as a a nation, we think it's a good thing for um, older people, for older workers to continue to work for a lot of a lot of reasons. We have to face this interaction between disability, older workers, the obstacles to older workers, and you know, as I said, some of the, the sort of deep solutions that people have, like raising the retirement age. At least in Europe, didn't appear to work very very well. Uh, read the point. And you know, I think as a country, we've been, with the exception of Quebec, I think this is true. I'm not aware of a province that has, has put together a coherent 
framework of policies that are about we want people to work longer into their older ages. Uh, and here, here are the ways we're going to put the opportunities in place for people to do that. Um, instead, I think what we've done is we've had the expectation that to meet the labor market needs going forward, we're going to continue the very generous um, open immigration policies we've had, right? Which is, which is fine. But many of the European countries which have not had the tradition we have had for 30 years of really open immigration, like 250,000 new Canadians a year come to the this country. Right? Many European countries don't have that tradition. They've been more creative about thinking about, well, okay, what are the sets of incentives and protections that we need to be able to provide to a 60-year-old, a 65-year-old, a 70-year-old to encourage them to stay at work? So it's a good point. Just one point back is that I've seen the projections from the federal government, and even with you know, quite generous immigration of 250,000, and, and there is limits to the immigration the federal government itself doesn't think that's going to, as I understand it, solve the problem, the working problem. That partly, to a considerable extent, it's going to have to be from our, our local workers. Because there's limits to immigration, and there are other uh, follows about immigration, too. Um, part of it is that the immigrants come and they start behaving like we do. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Not to not to their not to their credit. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, um, thanks. Thanks very much.